in many other countries of the world, people thoroughly analyze the character of a man vying for the presidency. For instance, in the United States, it is common for handlers of a presidential candidate to recommend that they release a biography in the run-up to an important presidential election. In Kenya, and indeed in most of Africa, it is a very different game. Media houses will not take time, or will very rarely take time, to do any digging into a presidential candidate's past. Even the voters themselves are not very interested in the past of a presidential candidate. Yeah, they focus on the goodies he are promised by a presidential candidate. But of course, the most important aspect voters focus on is the tribe of a presidential candidate. You know the sad story. But on today's show, we shall focus on the past of the three individuals on whose hands yeah, the fate of our country, the future, what will happen after 2022, all that is in the hands of these three men. You can huff and puff about any other individual any other presidential candidate. But ultimately, our fate is in the hands of these three men. The three men are, of course, President Uhuru Mwigai Kenyatta, Raila Amolo Odinga, and Deputy President William Samoy Ruto. Now, the character of a man never changes, but their politics changes. Their politics is influenced by other politicians. Yeah. So let's start by first understanding the political influence on these three men and then we'll quickly move to their characters. And this one should be most fascinating. Yeah. So put on your seatbelts and tighten them. <laughs> Incidentally, all three men have been greatly influenced by the politics of a man called Daniel Toretich Arab Moy. But to grasp and understand Moy politics, it is critical to understand that Moy was also influenced. His politics was influenced by Kenya's first president, Mze Jomo Kenyatta. And Kenyatta was influenced by a man called Tom Boy. Let me explain. Jomo Kenyatta's hand was forced yeah, to become the harsh, tough, draconian dictator of a president he was. The pressure Jomo felt from Boy was real. And it is therefore not surprising that he became the kind of president who crushed, quickly crushed, any semblance of opposition to his presidency, any threat to his presidency. Daniel Toretich Arab Moy was the humblest person in character we have ever had as president of Kenya. And initially, he tried very hard to be a very different president from Jomo Kenyatta, although he told us at the time that he was going to follow in the footsteps of Kenyatta. The rhetoric was that he was going to Fuatanyayo, follow in the footsteps. But this is politics, and that was just talk, talk, talk. The reality is that Moy was disgusted yeah, with a lot of things that happened during the Kenyatta presidency, including things that happened to him personally. Yeah, he's being bullied by the Kiambu Mafia. And therefore, in his heart, he wanted to distance himself as far as possible from the Kenyatta presidency. But of course, it was a mission impossible. Anyway, 
the rhetoric served a very important purpose. You see, Moi was a sudden president. Yeah, he had to reassure many people, investors in Kenya, powerful forces in Kenya, cartels. It was a smart move, and indeed a necessary move, to convince everybody that things would remain the same, that there would be no drastic change yeah, to upset the apple cut during his presidency. And shortly after August 1978, when Moi took over, there were no political detainees in the country. But he inherited the same intelligence community that had served Jomo Kenyatta. He inherited the very same state machinery. And even before the 1982 coup, Moi started looking very much like another version of Jomo Kenyatta. Now, in the past, I have said that the 1982 coup changed Moi and changed the Moi presidency. And indeed, very many other analysts have repeated the same. But the recent very revealing video I did yeah, on the 1982 coup, which is available on this channel, I believe you can see a link on the top right-hand corner of your screens right now that will lead you to it. Yeah, just click on that link, put it aside, and when we're done here, you can rush there if you've not yet taken it in already. That video forced me to take a second look at the Moi presidency during this period, especially the year 1981, which was the year before the coup, the attempted coup. Moi had already started changing. Yeah, we had political detainees once again. Political opponents were being dealt with ruthlessly, once again. Anyway, the Moi presidency ended up being greatly influenced by the Jomo Kenyatta presidency. But Moi's character never changed. He still had a lot of compassion yeah, for the ordinary Kenyan, which may seem to be a contradiction, yeah, because at the same time, the Moi administration robbed the ordinary Kenyan blind. Corruption went overboard. But who said human character is simple? And straightforward. Who told you that? Anyway, my point is, all three men critical to the future of Kenya have greatly been influenced by Kenya's second president, Daniel Toretichar of Moi. And that is why you'll hear some analysts say that all these leaders we have today are Kanu orphans, Moi orphans. Yeah, and I totally agree. That is accurate. Deputy President William Samoy Ruto was in fact in the Moi administration. He closely studied Moi politics from close range in his formative years in politics. Raila Odinga closely copied Moi politics to beat Moi at his own game. Moi's strategy was to secure all tribal kingpins to always win in politics. Raila did precisely the same in the run-up to the 2002 presidential elections and crowned it all with his master stroke of Kibaki Tosha which neatly neutralized Moi's strategy of winning 2002 by securing the House of Mumbi vote. Yeah, he cancelled that advantage because Kibaki is a Kikuyu, as was Moi's candidate in that election, Uhuru Kenyatta. And when we come to President Uhuru Kenyatta, <laughs> Moi was his mentor, his political mentor. And so I trust that I've proved to you all these three men, when it comes to political ideology, are exactly the same. They are all Moi orphans. And so it all comes down to their characters to differentiate the three who are critical to our future and the future of our children and grandchildren. Now, let's start with the president. 
Now, many people don't know this. Yeah, but I believe I captured it perfectly in my landmark book, Dark Secrets of the Kenyan Presidency. Uhuru grew up knowing, in his knowing, that one day he would be the president of Kenya. It started with his father grooming him when he was very young. Carefully examine many Jomo Kenyatta presidential pictures from the early days. And you'll quickly notice that indeed Uhuru is in many of those photographs, especially photographs involving official presidential business. It was always Uhuru alone, yeah, not his brother Moho. And it all boils down to a prophecy by a man called Kungu Magana, a very famous seer and traditional healer of the time, yeah, who made this prophecy when Jomo Kenyatta was only seven years old, or thereabouts. And Jomo Kenyatta grew up knowing that he was going to be a great leader. Many times he was frustrated and gave up. But that prophecy came to pass, finally, in the sunset years of his life. That is also very accurately captured in my book, Dark Secrets of the Kenyan Presidency. And I believe Moy knew about this prophecy. And that is why Uhuru was very sure he was going to be president in 2002. He was going to take over from Moy. But it was not to be. Yeah, because the time had not yet arrived. You know, there is a huge problem people have with predictions and prophecies, especially by people who are able to see into the future. Because you see, most prophecies don't have a timeline. I think the best example to give here is from the Holy Bible. The great prophet Elijah prophesied what would happen to a very evil woman called Jezebel. And the great Elijah departed from earth. Yeah, he didn't die, he departed. And another prophet called Elisha took over. And the years went on. How do you think people at the time were talking? Ah, uh, oyo Elijah, alikuwa fake. Remember his prediction about Jezebel? Hakuna kitu imefanyika. Uyo alikuwa mtu fake. The Jezebel prophecy must have really messed up Elijah's legacy at the time. He was a great prophet. But this prophecy on Jezebel, I, he, he, it never came to pass. But one day, after people had started forgetting Elijah, it happened exactly the way he had prophesied. It happened, finally. Timelines when it comes to a prophecy. And I believe the case is the same with those people who made some prophecies about a man called Donald Trump. You see, prophecies don't give you details. They don't tell you this will happen first, then that will happen, then you'll have to wait a little longer, then this will happen, then finally. No, they don't. You need to understand this point, to understand the frustrations that were in the life of a man called Jomo Kenyatta. He waited and waited and got old. And then to make matters worse, yeah, he finally ended up in prison. Turn up for something he didn't do. Fabricated case. Fabricated evidence. I am sure he told people when he was behind bars, Huyu uncle wangu alikuwa naito kungu wa magana. Fake. Mutu fake sana. But it finally came to pass. And that is why, in grooming Uhuru, I am sure the first president of Kenya had no doubts on his mind that it would come to pass. When you understand this, you will understand the character of our president much better. And whatever you want to say about him, yeah, and especially focusing on his shortfalls, which are many, out of the three men, 
is the one who is best placed to believe in things bigger than himself, to believe in the greater good of the nation, and to believe in being patient and waiting, and to believe ultimately what will be, will be whatever else happens. And so you can perfectly understand how you would react to raw ambition and impatience yeah, of anybody for power and the presidency. Now on to Raila Odinga. Yeah, and I'm trying to summarize and highlight the character of this man. Raila has been on the run most of his life, always looking over his shoulder. Neither of the two other men have been in the trenches fighting and surviving. And neither of the two other men can ever be able to reach Rayla's level of empathy for the common man. And that is where Rayla will never have the ruthlessness often required in a leader yeah, at the highest level. He will never have the decisiveness yeah, that is necessary to rule. But of course he has a lot of other admirable qualities yeah, that are important, that are necessary in our situation as a country today. The fact that Raila is too forgiving has worked for the betterment of the nation, has worked to the advantage of the country called Kenya. After Moi put him through hell on earth, Raila was still able to sit down with Moi and negotiate. Yeah, and form an alliance with Kano, yeah, through his party at the time, NDP. And it is the same Rayla who stood in the way and blocked a motion in parliament that was designed to deal with Moy. This is after Moy retired, yeah, and make him accountable for the evil he committed. When he was president, Raila blocked that and rallied his ODM troops to block it so that it went absolutely nowhere. And as a result, Kenya's second president was able to enjoy his retirement yeah, and quietly live the twilight years of his life. Yep, the same Moy who had left him with wounds which to this day have not healed. Now, Deputy President William Samoy Ruto is a completely different kettle of fish. Raised in very humble beginnings, Ruto has risen to be the second most powerful person in the entire country, the Deputy President. A heartbeat away from the presidency. He is a man in a terrible hurry. He is impatient. Yeah, indeed, his temper, his short fuse, is legendary. He once fought, yeah, a man on the grounds of State House during Moy's presidency. And later, he said he fought the man old enough to be his father because the man called him a con man. Admittedly, this impatience, yeah, and wanting things to be done fast, like yesterday, has benefited Kenyans. I credit the deputy president more than anybody else with the spirited attempt to modernize a lot of things in government, to increase efficiency, the Huduma centers, which make it much easier for any Kenyan to access important vital government services. Today, renewing your driving license takes a few minutes. Yeah on the computer and with funds in your MPES account. Or if you want to get a temporary passport yeah, to travel to one of our neighboring countries, it's easy. You do it on a computer with a connection to the internet. Before the Jubilee government came into power in 2013, these were services that would need you to spare an entire day of queuing in a very long queue and moving from government official to government official, most of whom would require a small bribe to keep things moving. But there are the other very important qualities required of a president. 
Ruto does not have those qualities and he will never have them. His character will never allow him to have them. He has also been linked to too many scandals, both from his personal life and especially linked to corruption. In at least one instance, he has even appeared in court. He has been arraigned in court. His supporters will of course say he has never been convicted. He are found guilty by a court of law and therefore he is innocent. But the biggest question that lingers yeah, over the head of this man in a hurry is the question of how he acquired his vast wealth so quickly. He definitely didn't do it the Steve Jobs way. Yeah, you know Steve Jobs, the founder of the Apple computer company, the inventor of the smartphone. It seems he did it in the same way most of the super rich Kenyans yeah, gained their wealth, their vast wealth. Before him, yeah, his is more recent, but it seems he did it in the same way. And so, Kenyans have to ask the question, what will happen if Ruto ascends to the presidency and has nobody to answer to? Indeed, the question his opponents, political opponents will always ask is, if he did what he allegedly did before he was president, what will he do when he's president? The deputy president's character is not forgiving. He's definitely not good at keeping relationships, especially with those who have helped him in the past. People like Gideon Moy and Cyrus Njirongo always have a story to tell about the character of the deputy president. Those two men, more than anybody else, greatly assisted the deputy president to rise up from poverty and oblivion to what he is today. They were his initial backers. Today, they have a very icy, frosty relationship yeah, away from politics. Although it is true that when Cyrus Njirongo was declared bankrupt yeah, about two years ago, Ruto made a hefty donation to bail him out. Folks, as we approach the 2022 general elections, let us take a very close look at the characters of the people we may want to elect president. Now, if you've enjoyed my video, please remember to give me a like. And I also need to remind you about my weekly intelligence briefings, number 66, which has some very explosive information on the ongoing Laikipia crisis. Yeah, and of course, you can take advantage of our very special offer. Details on your screens right now. Get it. I highly recommend it. When you take advantage of this offer, you'll also be able to get all the other WIBs ever published. Yeah. And that is quite a lot of very sensitive information, all packed into one forum. Just use the email address you see on your screens right now, send a blank email, and you'll instantly get a response via automated email, yeah, automated response email, giving you full payment details. Go for it. Until next time, this is Chris Kumekucha.